Well, good grief. What are we to do with Jesus' words to us in this morning's gospel reading? You know, this week I listened all through the week to people who are in difficult circumstances, someone who's facing a difficult diagnosis, a young adult who feels like they're failing, a parent of young children trying to find the resources, both the time and finances, just to make it to the end of the month. And as if life isn't difficult enough for us already, here is Jesus, now at the pinnacle of his Sermon on the Mount, commanding his disciples, then and now, to do some of the most difficult things imaginable. To turn the other cheek, don't retaliate, love your enemies, pray for those who would attack you, give to everyone who begs from you. I mean, what's a preacher to do? On Friday afternoon, I was still struggling with my sermon, and so I decided that I needed some help from my community. And so I brought this text to our Friday fellowship group. That group is a group of seniors that meets on Friday afternoons for a time of worship and learning and some lunch as well. And so I read this text to them, and I said, I asked, what do you think? I mean, does Jesus really mean this? Is he serious about this stuff? Well, they gave me some faithful and honest responses. Someone pointed out that this did not seem practical. I mean, what about evil powers in the world like Hitler or ISIS? Wouldn't they be ruling the world without violent intervention? And then there was one person, and I really love this, he then countered his own objections, pointing out that rushing to the most violent and forceful uh, response often leads not to resolution or peace, but to greater violence and destruction. And someone else was honest enough to point out our almost universal failure in responding to some of these commands. Give to everyone who begs from you? I mean, do any of us really do that? I don't think so. And then, then they pointed to that last verse, the kicker. You heard it too. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's face it, they said, nobody's perfect except for God. So what's a preacher to do? Well, it seems to me that we make a couple of mistakes when it comes to interpreting Jesus' words here. And one is not to take them seriously. Now, I think this might be a particularly Lutheran temptation. After all, all of us here are big on grace, right? Every good Luther knows that we're saved not by good works, but by God's grace that's poured out on us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But are we in danger of just presuming on that grace of God? Are we in danger of grace becoming just an excuse for us in avoiding these hard things, this life-giving way that Jesus calls us to? A second temptation, I think, is to take these words too seriously, believing somehow when we hear them that it's all up to us, we are the ones who need to save this world. We need to rid the world of all of its sin and failure through our own efforts and actions. And in this way, we don't really need or even make room for the grace and power of God. Well, believe it or not, I found the most help in returning to the last verse of this reading. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The scholars that I turned to pointed out that the word that we translate here as perfect is the Greek word telos. Now, telos is also the Greek word for goal or end or purpose. And so it implies less moral perfection than it does reaching one's intended purpose or outcome. So, for example, the telos of an arrow shot is to reach the target. 
and the talos of an apple tree is to yield apples. In this sense, the word is more about becoming what is intended, about accomplishing one's God-given purpose in the same way that God is constantly reflecting God's purpose. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus is announcing that he is coming to bring in the kingdom of God. This is his purpose. And here Jesus calls us to be people who join him in this work of bringing in God's reign of justice and love, peace, forgiveness, generosity in a world and in circumstances that are often not any of these things. On Friday afternoon, Pastor Harold Vold said this, to live in this way is a source of such hope. On Wednesday night, United Lutheran experienced something that I believe was a very uh, first experience for us, a hip-hop service right here in the sanctuary of United Lutheran Church. It was a service of song and word led by a rapper, Dave Shear, and a spoken word poet, Dave, Joe Davis. They're from North Minneapolis. Dave is a young white man and Joe is a young black man. And they challenged us in their message to consider how it is that we embody and live the love of God in Jesus in the face of divisions among races in our nation. After the service, uh, they were selling t-shirts. And one of the t-shirts that they sold had this slogan printed on it, a bright yellow t-shirt, love your haters. And one person from our congregation bought that shirt and he held on to it and he said, you know, I need this shirt, Pastor, because I've got a lot of haters. <laughs> and I think I know enough about his story to know that this was his way of saying, you know, there's got to be a better way than just returning hate for hate or revenge for vengeance. In the face of selfishness and violence and hate, Jesus is calling us to live a better way, to love rather than hate, to forgive rather than begrudge, to embrace rather than protect, to share rather than hoard, to heal rather than to wound. And this is how we live into the fullness, the perfection of who God has called us to be. Martin Luther King Jr. captured, I think, the logic of Jesus' kingdom when he stated, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. The fullness, the per perfection of who God is, is love. And as we love, we live into the fullness of God's intention for us. I want to say that at times this text has been used to keep marginalized people or people in abusive relationships or marriage quiet or accepting of violence or unjust conditions. And I want to be very clear that is in no way the intention of this text. God's intention is always, always to lead us to love and new life. And so Jesus called to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to give more than would be expected is the call for us to put an end to violence and to move toward life-giving relationships. This is hard stuff that Jesus commands. And too often I, and I suspect you, fall short. A few years ago, my sister gave me a little book. We were struggling, she and I, with how to deal with another sister who tries when she is at her worst to provoke us to respond in ways that we don't feel good about. And in this little book, The 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life, the author Karen Armstrong begins by writing about our reptilian brain that one that is still present there beneath our more developed brains. The reptilian brain is responsible for the fight 
or flight response and our need for revenge or retribution. And it's a helpful thing when, for example, you're being chased by a wild animal and you need an adrenaline rush to run away and climb a tree for safety. It has a purpose, but it is not helpful in responding to people that we know and love. It's not helpful in creating loving relationships with people we care about or in building communities of life-giving connection and compassion. Jesus calls us to be more, to respond from something more than our reptilian brain. And he invites us to claim and to live our identity as God's beloved people. And I look around and I see examples of this everywhere. I see it in the parents who are now divorced, but they're sitting next to each other in the pew on Sunday morning to encourage and support their child who's singing that morning. Or I see it in this community when a local restaurant that is owned and operated by a woman who is a Muslim was firebombed. And this community responded by raising thousands of dollars for a new beginning and by Christians of all denominations gathering together at the burned out storefront to light candles and to pray and to stand in solidarity and support with those who had been attacked because of their religion. The early church lived these commands of Jesus. They refused to return the violence that was so often inflicted on them. And that church was not diminished, but rather grew in number and in influence as people saw this amazing power of God's redeeming love alive and being lived out in their community. Of course, our ultimate example is Jesus himself. Jesus, who spoke these words, offered his disciples a share in his life in a meal of bread and wine, even as his betrayer sat at the table. Jesus, who asked his disciple to put away his sword when the soldiers came to arrest him. Jesus, who from the cross prayed for forgiveness for those who placed him there. All of this he did so that we might know the height and the depth of God's love for this world. And through this love have our hearts changed and from our hearts flow changed relationships and a changed world. Today, we are graciously invited once again to receive Jesus' gifts of love and life in the bread and wine of Holy Communion. May we who receive the life-giving love of God in Jesus' body and blood in turn, embody this in the world, becoming, by God's grace, what we have first received. Amen.